All right. <laughs> All right, good evening. And welcome to tonight's Humanity Center event featuring Mike Ingram, author of Notes from the Road. Um, before we get started, I first want to thank the WVU Honors College uh, for their support during Mike's visit to our campus. And I would also like to welcome our Zoom enabled audience and remind you to put any questions for tonight's guests in the Q&A. Uh, Joseph Deal, the Humanity Center assistant, will be happy to share them as time allows during the Q&A portion of our uh, event tonight. And I just wanted to thank Joseph, who uh, takes care of all of the incidental things for Humanity Center events, including cupcakes and delicious coffee. So we could just give him a little love. <laughs> thank you. So if you log into the homepage for Barrel House, a literary organization that operates a journal, a press, a day-long writing conferences in Pittsburgh and DC, and a wonderful long weekend sojourn for writers known as Writer Camp, you'll see a picture of me back in my long hair days, sitting next to a lovely babbling brook, talking with Mike Ingram. In many ways, this is how I know Mike best, chatting about all things writing, conversations that spill over into other subjects. In a complicated field where the lines between success and just barely making it and not making it at all can seem blurred and indeterminate, it can be hard to make true writing friends. But after many summers in central Pennsylvania, I don't know that I could ask for a better writing friend than Mike Ingram. Mike engages with the literary world, not only as a writer, but what we've come to term a literary citizen. He created venues for the work of others. He shepherded new books into existence through a small but vital literary press. And he discusses writing on his literary podcast, Book Fight, using wit and humor as a ballast. Through all these activities, Mike helps promote the art and culture of writing, breaking down barriers that prevent writers from engaging with one another and with the larger literary culture. But Mike is also one heck of a writer. His words are meaningful without being pretentious, and he is willing to be vulnerable on the page. This gives his prose a quiet, resilient strength. And in Notes from the Road, we discover a writer willing to take risks with the form as he shapes his lived experience. The subtle artfulness of Mike's craft is also often hidden beneath the approachability of his writing. Throughout this remarkable little book, and I actually mean little, quite literally, right? It's a little brick of a book. Mike pulls you onto the road with him, long stretches where his mind works on the real world cares of modern existence as the otherworldly aspects of the road trip pass on by. Sometimes Mike treats us to touristy side quests, while other times he examines bits of lesser known American history. We are there with him, for every ubiquitous breakfast of rubbery, hard-boiled eggs and yogurt, for which we can only wish him a fluffy, scrumptious omelet that never comes to be. With a wry wink, Mike shares the arcane and the mundane, but it never gets superfluous or superficial, for Mike understands that there is truth in the ways we poke fun. He makes loneliness a journey that we might almost that might almost be bearable, and he never insults our intelligence with easy answers or convenient wrap ups. Instead, he lets the road linger in our imagination. Mike Ingram is a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, and he teaches writing at Temple University. His stories, essays, and journalism have appeared in a number of publications, including Phoebe, the North American Review, the Smart Set, and Medium's Human Parts. His first book, Notes from the Road, was published by Auspress in March 2022. 
and I am truly delighted to present the WVU community, the author, editor, podcaster, and my friend, Mike Ingram. Thank you so much, Renee. That was so nice. I have to get my things sorted. Hi to everybody. I've already talked to a number of you, but hi to all the people that I have not talked to yet, and to all the people on the internet. I'll just assume that there's like hundreds of people on the other side of this that are all judging me quietly. And also that I look okay on their screen. I don't know, this might not be my best angle. Sorry. Um, so I thought for kind of our, our program tonight, I was going to talk just briefly about sort of the origin story of this book, because it was a little bit of an unusual path to becoming a book. Um, and then I thought I would read a bit, um, do some Q&A, see where we're at. Um, and, you know, happy to talk about whatever. So um, depending on questions that people have, um, you know, if people are interested in talking about writing or publishing or other aspects of the literary world, um, you know, any of that stuff is fair game. Um, so this book in particular, I guess the sort of narrative of where this book came from starts, gosh, probably like 10 years ago. It seems so long ago now, um, which wasn't when I started writing this book, but when I started writing some nonfiction. Um, and I mentioned this because I feel like there's maybe a lesson in this for not just writers, but anyone about thinking about the work that you want to do versus the work that you feel like you are supposed to be doing. Uh, which I feel like we all kind of struggle with that probably from time to time or, you know, could use to think about it. And so I was somebody who had been, you know, quote unquote, trained as a fiction writer and thought of myself as a fiction writer. Um, that was sort of an important part of my identity. And um, I was, you know, 10 years ago, deep in the throes of trying to make a novel work and it just was not happening. Uh, it was <laughs> kind of painful and uh, not going all that well. And I guess one sort of anecdote that maybe exemplifies how much of a struggle it was at the time and how much in my own head I was with that project, there was, there came a point where I was like, I feel like, I mean, I had written a full draft or full-ish draft of this book, but it just wasn't coming together right. And it's like, I feel like if I could just get the first 20 pages of this like nailed, then everything else is going to be easy. Like when I go back and so I had given myself that as a task one day, this one manic day that I was just like, I'm going to like rewrite the first 20 pages of this book until I get it right. And I would sit there and I would write like a few paragraphs and then I would get frustrated and I would like tear it up. And then it got to where like, as I could, like the more times I did it, the less I was producing, I would get like three sentences in and be like, this sucks and throw it away. And I finally was like, I think I need a break maybe from this project. Uh, and the only way that I could take a break was to tell myself it was a break because at that point, and you all have probably had a version of this experience too, in whatever um, field you're in where I was like, I've devoted a lot of hours to this thing. And I couldn't conceive of telling myself like it's over and I'm walking away. So I was like, it's just a break, you know, uh, we'll take a little break and, oh, thanks. Angle. Oh yeah, that's probably better. <laughs> <laughs> nope. <laughs> um, so I decided to just take a break and not look at the manuscript for like a month or two. Um, and one of the deals that I made with myself so that I could keep writing in that time was that I was just gonna get up every day and for the first 15 minutes of the day, I was gonna sit down with a pen and some paper and just write whatever I wanted to, like with no particular goal in mind, no particular story. Uh, I was gonna do that even before I had coffee. Um, that part got revised after a couple of days where I was like, maybe we'll do coffee and then the writing. Uh, but before I did any other meaningful stuff, like I didn't check my email, I didn't like look at Twitter um, and there was no point to it. I was just like, I'm gonna write some stuff and maybe I'll get back in touch with how writing used to be fun, I think. Um, and a lot of the stuff that ended up filling those notebooks was just, you know, it'd be like a rant one day or something that kind of looked like a poem, but wasn't really a poem because I don't know how to write poems. Um, but over the course of a couple months, I filled a couple little notebooks and started to realize there were some patterns in that work and some things I was interested in and ended up writing probably two or three essays assembled out of material from those notebooks um, and published them and felt good about them. And was like, oh, maybe this nonfiction thing is something that I should actually do. And it felt like I was writing more in my own voice and not just because the stuff was true, but it felt a little more natural. Um, and then this book in particular came out of, I mean, obviously a road trip. Um, for those of you who read the book, for those of you who haven't, it follows me on a road trip. Um, 
but it, it wasn't like I set out on that trip to write a book. I just took this trip because it was an opportunity to drive a friend's car across the country and try to figure out some things about my life. Um, and it really started its life then as just a very short essay, really kind of a blog post, because I had recently redone my own website and was like, oh, I feel like I should put up some content if I'm going to have my own website again. Uh, and so I had thrown up kind of a short version of this. And then, you know, fast forward at least a couple, three, four something years. Um, and somebody with the press that ended up publishing the book was interested in me turning it into like a shorter book length thing. Um, all of which is just to say that sometimes books come about in really weird ways. I mean, I spent a lot of time as a writer thinking I was following a very particular path and like, well, I need to write this kind of stuff and publish in these places. And then somebody from, I don't know, New York maybe like comes to your apartment and gives you a crown and a check and anoints you like a professional writer. And it was like interesting that it was like, oh, this was like an accident that this book came into being, but I was so happy with it. So I don't, there's probably like a life lesson in that somewhere. Um, so I'm going to read a um, some bits from the book. I tend to, when I've been doing readings, um, I end up, it's almost like a challenge to see if I can create kind of like a little essay out of pieces of the book. So this is mostly in chronological order, but um, there may be some things that if you haven't read the book, you might, you know, it's not exactly going through in linear order. Um, for those of you not familiar with the book, I think the only thing you would really need to know is that like I said, I was on a road trip where I was driving a friend's car across the country. He had gotten a job writing for television. And I was like a little vaguely jealous of that. And also trying to figure out kind of my own career and life. And um, I guess the only other bit of relevant information is that I had also recently quit smoking. I feel like that comes up in some of these, <laughs> in some of these bits. And apparently I've learned from Renee's class comes up in the book, maybe more than I even realized. Um, East of Oklahoma City, I detoured off Interstate 40 to connect with Route 66 and to see a famous round barn. The barn was famous for being round, which is an unusual shape for a barn. That wasn't the world's only round barn or even the only round barn in the United States. But according to the internet, it was one of the most photographed roadside attractions on Route 66, a road chock full of roadside attractions. So I figured I should stop and photograph it. I took pictures of the barn from a variety of angles I walked around its perimeter, searching for the best light, the most artful framing. Though even as, I, even as I took these pictures, I was aware that there were already thousands of similar pictures on the internet. In fact, I'd looked at several of them a little over an hour ago while eating lunch and trying to decide if stopping at this red barn was worth the detour. What would be different or better about these pictures I was taking? Why did they need to exist? I suppose this is why people take selfies to commemorate their presence at a place rather than the place itself, but there was no need for me to commemorate my presence at the round barn either. It wasn't a particularly memorable experience. It was a barn, it was round. Inside, there was a gift shop where you could buy merchandise related to the round barn and also merchandise that had nothing whatsoever to do with the round barn. After leaving the barn, I stopped for gas, but as soon as I got out of the car, I saw a sign in the window of the station advertising cigarettes for under $5 a pack. My addict brain started making idiot calculations I got back into the car and drove off before I could do something I'd regret. Oh, okay. I oh, was going to replace this one on. <laughs> Did I? Yeah, mine is recording as well. Just gonna Thank take you. that. Yeah. Oh wait, what yep. happened? Uh, there's a cord right here. Sorry. Uh, oh no, the window just went row, row. down. Maybe it's not minimized. Oh okay. <laughs> Sorry. Route 66 was officially commissioned in 1926, though it wasn't fully paved until 1938, one year before John Steinbeck published The Grapes of Wrath and three years before America entered World War II. In 1928, a sports promoter named C.C. Pyle, people said the initials stood for cash and carry, organized a cross-country foot race that would cover the entire distance of the road from Los Angeles to Chicago and then go on to New York where runners would finish by going several laps around a track inside Madison Square Garden. Pyle promised $60,000 in prize money, including 25 grand to the winner. 
He also promised to refund the entry fee to anyone who finished. He called his event the transcontinental foot race, though the name invented by the press was the one that ultimately stuck, the Bunyan Derby. Pyle had made his money as a theater owner and sports agent. He convinced football star Red Grange to turn pro in 1925, and he led a team of professional tennis players on a kind of barnstorming tour around the US, helping to popularize the sport with American audiences. Pyle traveled the Bunyan Derby course alongside the runners in a $25,000 bus he'd outfitted for the event. He took an entourage with him, including Grange, plus a carnival-style freak show that featured a tattooed man, a five-legged pig, and the preserved corpse of an Oklahoma outlaw. Each night, they'd put on a show, and the runners would be required to make an appearance before the gathered crowds. Pyle believed these shows would be the real money makers for the race, that cities and towns would buy for the opportunity to be nightly stops along the route. It turned out to be a tougher sell than he anticipated, and giving out stops to the highest bidder also resulted in daily stages for the runners that were all over the place. The shortest day covered only 16 miles, the longest covered 75. Several runners dropped out on day one in the heat of the California desert. By the time the race reached Oklahoma, the original field of 275 had been whittled down to 80. In the end, 55 made it to Madison Square Garden. The race's winner, Andy Payne, finished in roughly 578 hours, a pace of about 10 minutes a mile over the 3,400 mile course. Payne wasn't a professional runner, unlike many of the field's favorites. He grew up on his family's farm in Oklahoma, and in 1927, he moved to Los Angeles, but he found work difficult to come by. He'd run track in high school, and when he saw the Bunyan Derby announcement, he figured it was worth a shot. I knew I was strong and could run, he told a reporter, and I just concluded that I would stand as good a chance as any. Uh-oh, this battery's running low now. In Amarillo, I stayed at a hotel I'd chosen online the night before based chiefly on its atrium design, which brought back fond memories of a favorite childhood hotel we sometimes stopped at on the way to my grandmother's house in Florida. As a kid, the indoor pool had felt like the very height of luxury. I remember the smell of chlorine and the atrium's leafy plants, which suggested a tropical rainforest. I remember that there was a poolside bar and grill where parents could sip tropical drinks while keeping an eye on the kids. Here, though, the atrium design felt tired, sad, a holdover from another era, one that had ended badly. The lighting was suspiciously dim. The indoor pool was murky. The only remaining trace of the atrium restaurant was a circular bar being used by the cleaning staff as a staging area. Even by the standards of fake plants, the ferns were ghastly. I ate dinner at an Outback Steakhouse because it was close enough to walk and I didn't feel like getting back into the car. The prime rib special was better than I expected it to be, but the bartender was so aggressively friendly that it got exhausting. At one point, the male half of a turtlenecked couple down the bar called out to him, hey, help us settle a bet. Which one's harder to learn, golf or tennis? If you've never tried either, the woman said, that part's important, you're starting from scratch. The bartender made a faux thoughtful face. He looked up at the ceiling. Wow, guys, that's a tough one, he said. That's a real head scratcher. Then he smiled and he shot them with finger pistols. On the walk back to the hotel, I slipped on a patch of ice and landed on my ass. I wondered, not for the first time, why I'd signed up for this trip. Shouldn't I be back in Philadelphia, getting ready for the semester that would start in a little over a week? I should be writing. I should be putting my syllabi together. I should be patching up the leaks in the little boat of my relationship or else giving it a dignified ocean burial. That night, my girlfriend and I talked on the phone and her voice was a comfort, but the conversation itself felt halting, strained. I told myself it was lousy reception. In the morning, in the depressing atrium, one of the housekeepers pointed me to an urn of coffee set off from the others and marked strong. I read her smile as conspiratorial, but more than likely, I just looked like someone in need of strong coffee. I ate a rubbery hard-boiled egg and a tiny carton of yogurt, and I shoved a banana and an orange into my bag for later. I drove over to 6th Street, 6th Street, which is where the original Route 66 passed through town. There was an old Art Deco theater. There were antique stores. There were signs reminding you that this was the original Route 66 in case you'd somehow managed to forget. There were no other people around. I could see my breath. The crosswalk was icy and I had to take tiny delicate steps. I could picture the sidewalk cafes being popular in warmer months. The Bunyan Derby didn't make C.C. Pyle rich. In fact, it nearly ruined him. In Tulsa, the $25,000 bus was repossessed and in New York, he had to borrow money from a friend to pay the winners. 
The next year he tried again, this time with a race starting in New York and ending in LA. He upped the entrance fee, he made the runners pay for their own food, but this time too, he finished in the red. For weeks after the race, newspapers across the country carried coverage of the ensuing drama with the racers trying to collect their winnings and Pyle promising the money would get to them any day now. In the end, he had to declare bankruptcy to avoid going to jail. The runners got only a small fraction of what they were owed. This must have been especially heartbreaking for the winner, Johnny Salo, a New Jersey cop who'd finished second the first time around. He returned to Passaic and to his job at the police, though he ran in a few more promotional races, including one against a horse. In October 1931, he was on police duty at a local baseball game when he was hit in the head by a ball. He fell unconscious, and when he came to, he refused to be taken to the hospital. Later, he was directing traffic when several onlookers saw him stagger. He collapsed again, and this time someone called an ambulance. He never regained consciousness, dying that night in the hospital of a brain hemorrhage. He was 38. Pyle, meanwhile, managed something of a comeback, at least financially. A few years after the second race, he helped his friend Robert Ripley open the first, believe it or not, auditorium at the Chicago World's Fair. The attraction featured a man who could blow up balloons with his eye and a three-headed calf and a nine-year-old girl who'd been born with no arms and no legs. Pyle died a few years later at 56 of a cerebral thrombosis. By then, most of his former associates had written him off as a huckster and a charlatan, though the football star Red Grange stuck by him until the end. He had more ideas in one day, Grange told the New York Times, than most men have in an entire lifetime. I ate lunch in Tucumcari at a restaurant that billed itself as Mexican-American, which turned out to mean Mexican food prepared and served exclusively by white people. It was okay in the way that about 85% of life is okay. After lunch, I walked down Tucumcari's main street. I took pictures of murals and old hotel signs, the Bluebird, the Apache, the Palomino. Before Route 66, these little towns were farming communities. Some of them were nothing at all. Now, thanks to the interstate, to the convenience of truck stops and fast food and chain hotels, most of them have reverted to their original states. The lucky ones can at least claim an exit off I-40, put up billboards pleading with motorists to stop. In fact, that stopped in Tucumcari largely because of its aggressive marketing campaign, which had gone on for so long that I've been worn down by its sheer desperation. Driving through these towns, you could start to see their post-interstate plight as a metaphor for America itself. Then again, after enough time by yourself in a car, everything starts to look like a metaphor. The rubbery hard-boiled eggs at a hotel's breakfast bar are a metaphor for the compromises of adulthood. The ruined husk of an abandoned motor lodge is a metaphor for the human heart. That you landed in Tucumcari on the one day of the week when their kitschy dinosaur museum is closed is a metaphor for your entire goddamn life. Carson McCullers, in an essay called Look Homeward Americans, argues that people in this country suffer from a particular form of homesickness. It is no simple longing for the towns or country of our birth, she writes. The emotion is Janice-based. We are torn between a nostalgia for the familiar and an urge for the foreign and strange. As often as not, we are homesick most for the places we have never known. John Steinbeck sounds a similar note in Travels with Charlie. Perhaps we have overrated roots as a psychic need. Maybe the greater urge, the deeper and more ancient is the need, the will, the hunger to be somewhere else. In Santa Fe, I texted my girlfriend, new life plan, get a job at St. John's, teach the great books, live in a cool adobe house in the desert. A few seconds later, her reply vibrated in, at least I'll know where to send your Christmas cards. I was kidding mostly. I think she knew I was kidding mostly and was herself also mostly kidding. Though we got into a place where it was difficult to tell, even innocuous interactions felt freighted with meaning. And I did fall in love with Santa Fe. Maybe I'd been looking to fall in love. I splurged, relatively speaking, on a room in a cutesy inn downtown, and that first afternoon I walked the streets taking pictures of adobe houses. So many pictures. I took pictures of old adobe houses and new adobe houses, small adobe houses and large adobe houses. The colors were beautiful, all those browns and pale pinks in the late afternoon light. The air was scented with something I couldn't place, though later I would learn it was pinyon. That night, drinking Jack Daniels and cheap beer at a cash-only dive bar, I stumbled into a conversation with a pretty 20-something woman who moved to Santa Fe from Boston several months before. I was the same way with the adobe houses, she said. My boyfriend made fun of me for it. I don't even know which ones are nice, I said. I can't tell a fancy adobe house from a regular adobe house. It's a totally foreign language. 
She was drinking a gin and tonic and tapping absently at her phone. She had one of those studs in her nose that's so tiny you find yourself staring at it, leaning in, trying to decide if it's a jewel or only a trick of the light. Rich people put adobe walls around their property, she said. That's one way to tell, at least. Her boyfriend had grown up in Santa Fe, and something happened with his family that necessitated his coming back. She didn't provide any details, and I didn't press for any. Instead, I asked her how Santa Fe compared to the Northeast. Well, the weather here is a lot better, she said. There are more hippie artsy types, which I guess is mostly a good thing. I mean, I'm kind of a hippie artsy type, but now that I'm surrounded by so many of them, it's a little weird. She said she'd never loved Boston all that much when she was there, but now she found herself missing its rougher edges. People there always seem vaguely pissed off, she said, like they're just waiting to be annoyed. She laughed. I guess that sounds like a weird thing to miss. Probably you always miss something, I said. This sounded more profound in my head than it did out loud. Anyway, it seems relaxing here. That's only a first impression based on basically nothing, but it seems like it might be a relaxing place to live. She thought about that for a few seconds, and then she shrugged. Well, there are a lot of retirees. She knew the bartender, a heavily tattooed guy who drifted in and out of our conversation. The place was nearly empty, an off-season Tuesday. We talked about nothing of any real consequence, the kind of conversation that disappears from your brain as soon as it's over. But it was nice to talk. It was nice to be with people and not just in their general vicinity. Later, walking back to the hotel, I saw a guy smoking on a street corner, and I thought about asking if I could bum one. I looked at the app on my phone, which told me I hadn't smoked a cigarette in 38 days. I thought about how disappointed I'd be with myself if I had to reset the app to zero. Back in the hotel room, a tiny chocolate had been left on each pillow, along with a card about the local artisans who'd made them, a reward, I thought, for good behavior. Um, I'm just going to skip down and read a couple other short little things. Eventually, you learn to resist the siren song of the Route 66 Museum. Eventually, you come to see that even the good ones are unnecessary or at least redundant. The real museum is Route 66 itself, the motor inns and diners and kitschy roadside attractions that have been preserved like living dioramas. Like every museum, Route 66 wants to tell you a story. And the story being told by Route 66 is a particularly nostalgic one. It's the middle part of the 20th century. America has just helped win World War II, and back at home, the economy is booming. Newly minted middle-class families are using their newly acquired vacation days to pile into the car and see America. The dads wear madras shorts and Ray-Bans. The moms wear floppy hats and sundresses. In the back seat, the kids are outfitted in coonskin caps and fighting over whose turn it is with the Viewmaster. They're headed to the Grand Canyon. They're headed to Disneyland. They're headed to Santa Monica where they'll wade into the Pacific Ocean for the first time and be surprised by the chill. As with any museum, it's worth asking yourself whose story is being preserved and whose story is being ignored. It's worth asking yourself who's doing the telling and what other voices they might be talking over. And Route 66 is really more like a museum to a museum because the mid-century version of the Mother Road, the one all the Route 66 aficionados want to preserve, had its own nostalgic story to tell. Those vacationing families could visit a Wild West ghost town. The kids could spend their allowance on trinkets memorializing frontier culture, cowboy hats and Indian headdresses and plastic six shooters. They could even spend the night in a motor lodge that promised a quote, authentic wigwam experience. Never mind that the wigwams were made of cement or that they were actually teepees. Sometimes what you need is a bit of historical corrective, which was one reason I stopped off in Valentine, Arizona to look at the remains of an old Indian school. By Indian school, I mean a school set up by the US government in the early part of the 20th century to forcefully assimilate Native American children. The kids were separated from their parents and their tribes. They lived in dormitories. They got new clothes and new haircuts and new American names. They were warned not to speak in their native languages. A few years ago in a college composition course, I taught a unit on ideas of the frontier in American culture. And a lot of my students were shocked they'd never learned about these schools before. Their shock echoed my own shock some 20 years before when I learned about them in one of those eye-opening college history classes that changes your life a little bit and probably makes you insufferable to your parents at Thanksgiving dinner. This is one of the privileges of teaching, and it's one I sometimes need to remind myself of whenever I'm feeling anxious about money or status or job security. I get to spend a good chunk of my time in a room with young people talking with them about things that are important. I get to spend a lot of my time writing and reading and thinking 
It's worth remembering too, that in the glory days of Route 66, the ones we're supposed to feel so nostalgic for, black motorists had to carry with them a special guidebook to let them know where it was safe to eat and shop and spend the night. Several states along the route had segregation laws on the books, and even those that didn't, like California, had their share of sundown towns where black people weren't allowed, either by law or by custom, to be out on the street after dark. During the first Bunyan Derby, back in 1928, there were five African-American runners, including one, Edward the Sheik Gardner, who was among the favorites to win. In segregated states, the black runners had to sleep in a special colored-only tent, and they were harassed with racial slurs and even death threats as they ran. Near McLean, Texas, an hour east of Amarillo, a white man followed Gardner for an entire day in his truck, a shotgun trained on his back, daring him to pass any of the white runners ahead of him. It's worth remembering my own privileges, the ones I acquired at birth and the ones I've acquired since. It's worth remembering that in the grand scheme of things, my life is a pretty good life. I was born into an age of indoor plumbing. The bar down the street from my apartment has 14 rotating craft beers on tap. From somewhere inside my existential crisis, it occurred to me that having this sort of existential crisis was itself a particular kind of privilege. Should I stay with my girlfriend? Should I stay with my job? Should I give another city a try? What if I never finished the latest novel draft that was taking up space on my laptop's hard drive? From a world historical standpoint, it would be hard to argue that the answers to those questions mattered very much, which probably should have been humbling, though thinking about it that way didn't make me feel any less anxious, only smaller. One of the finishers of the Bunyan Derby was a man who called himself Wildfire Thompson. A few days after the race, a reporter spotted him running up and down a New York City street. He asked Thompson why he wasn't resting. After running clear across the United States, didn't he want to put his feet up for a while? But Thompson said he believed in tapering off. The race had been painful, sure, but over time you start to grow used to the pain. It becomes your daily companion. In a weird way, you forget how to live without it. When all the misery's gone, he said, you feel kind of lonesome and lost. Thanks. So I guess we can do questions. Is that our next agenda item? So if anybody has questions, I know Renee's class already worked through a bunch of them and put me through my paces. Yes. Oh, I think my favorite discovery, I don't know if this counts as a roadside attraction, although I guess it kind of is, was um, in Arizona where this man who basically started at the town of Lake Havasu uh, had bought the old London Bridge at auction and had the whole thing shipped to the United States and reassembled, um, like basically as a marketing gimmick to get people to come and populate this town that he was building. Um, and I drove over it. And the thing is, when you drive over it, it's just like a bridge. It's not really that interesting or impressive. Uh, there were these rumors I saw that apparent that some people thought he was under the mistaken assumption that he was buying the Tower Bridge, which is like the really famous bridge in London, and that he just didn't want to admit his mistake. Uh, but then I saw other places that seemed to debunk that. Um, but yeah, that one was kind of my favorite just because it was so strange. Like it wasn't actually like a very fun experience, but it was more like thinking about all the man hours of work that went into such a silly project. Yes. As you say that, I was wondering, did it strike you that there were any analogies along the way when you were looking at all these strange things that you put so many hours into and that you had the experience of having written the Oh, God. Well, I'm thinking about it now. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of depressing. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, maybe that's. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, maybe on some level, that's why I appreciate the absurdity of those kinds of projects, because, I mean, any kind of writing you're doing probably feels like that at some point, you know? I mean, even this book, which is now a book, and I'm, like, invited to this thing in West Virginia, and it's great, and I'm reading, and I'm like, ooh, I'm, like, a real author. Um, you know, there were a lot of parts along the way where it was like, boy, I sure have been spending a lot of time making a long Microsoft Word document on my computer. Uh, so, yeah, who's to say that that's any less silly than like buying the London Bridge and importing it. I just don't have enough money to buy the bridge, so this is the only thing I can do. Yeah. Um, I mm. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, and also just the, well, I guess I have two thoughts about that in terms of like beyond the writing. I mean, one of which is that I think it's totally natural to feel that way. Also, I feel like one thing I've learned as I've like gotten older is that if you're feeling that there's like something interesting happening there, you know, and it's not necessarily that you like screwed something up or that you're like on the wrong path. I mean, sometimes it's that you have some like cultural idea in your head of what success looks like or what your life is supposed to be like, or your parents told you that like, this is what you should do with your life. And it's hard to get to the point where you can say like, actually, that's not interesting to me. So I think, yeah, it's worth investigating that, um, not just from a writing standpoint, but just as like a life thing. Yes. Oh, you like at what point in writing the book you mean? Oh, um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess some of that probably comes from teaching. I think some of it comes from just my own interest areas, like. Um, some of the stuff in the book that was really fun to write, like about some of that historical stuff was like, just some, I mean, I'm just kind of interested in, in that. Um, I always tell my students actually that if I had to do it over again, I would consider majoring in history. I think I was one of those people that had like really boring history classes in high school and was like, why in the world would somebody want more of this? <laughs> and then I had a couple of good friends in college who were history majors and they would tell me about the things they were working on. I was like, oh, that's what this is about. That seems really cool. Like you just get to do a bunch of research and learn about weird aspects of American history and life. And um, so I think that had always kind of been in my brain. But like, uh, I think with a lot of these things, like I don't, I, this is not my original thought, but I know other writers have said that like they don't really know what it is they think until they write about it. And I often find that to be the case that, you know, this book in particular, I mean, I knew, well, when it was just a shorter piece, it's like, I knew that I wanted to write a thing about taking this trip but I don't think I knew until I was writing it that like, oh, this is really more about my life. And then I think when I was going through the process of expanding it and making it a book, I mean, that's when it kind of clicked in. Like part of it was just that I had been kind of collecting these stories about, I mean, a lot of the stories in the book are of just like historical, kind of peripheral historical figures who maybe like struck it rich or had some weird like success story. And at a certain point, I think I had to question like, why am I collecting these? Like, what is it that's interesting in them? And I think that's because I was interested in like ideas of success and what it means and those kind of American ideas of success stories, even if some of them feel silly, kind of. Yeah. How did the nature of the fact that you were driving and you had that time to want to play anything? Did it, did it add to the whole? Oh. Have this conversation you might not have Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I will say uh, one sort of thing that didn't make the book was I think I realized. So, I mean, this happened in the winter. I mean, I, driving across country in January is like a weird choice. Uh, but, you know, I had this friend who was in a spot and needed his car moved across the country. And at some point it dawned on me, probably in the middle of the trip, that the speed with which I volunteered to do that, like probably indicated that I was in a bit of a spot, you know, that like, that I think even on some subconscious level, the idea of just being alone in a car for a really long time seemed great. And I remember talking to friends who were like, why are you doing that? That seems awful, like by yourself. And I was like, oh my God, this seems amazing. But yeah, it's because I like had some stuff I needed to work out, I guess, and to think about. And I mean, I've always been somebody who, um, I mean, I don't do it as much anymore, you know, gas is expensive and it's probably not environmentally friendly. But when I was younger, I definitely was somebody who would just like get in the car and just go drive, you know, to like clear my head. Um, I went to college at JMU, not super far from here in Virginia, and pretty routinely would like drive into West Virginia, like the southern part of the state, and just like drive around and look at pretty things and listen to music. And I found that I've always gotten like kind of good thinking done. Now I try to take walks instead. That feels like the healthier option, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's funny because I've had a situation where Yeah. 
Right. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think so. I mean, although as I say that, I'm also a person who I rely on my phone so much for navigation that I probably wouldn't know what to do. If I mean, I remember getting lost on a hike a few years ago in an unfamiliar place and literally just been like, oh, right, I have a map on my phone and like figuring it out. So I would be lost without that. But I mean, I do also remember those days of like my dad was a big fan of the AAA triptych where they would highlight your route, you know, and um, I guess I have a nostalgic kind of missing of that. But I think it's more just giving yourself the space to do that. Like, I mean, I obviously had was able to navigate on the fly on this trip, but I also wasn't beholden to anyone else, which was a big part of it. So like, for instance, Santa Fe, which ended up being a place that I loved and spent like two pretty full days in. It's not like that had been on my itinerary. I was more kind of the night before in a hotel room looking at what was coming up and thinking like, I don't know, do I want to go through, maybe it was Tucson or something, you know, whatever would have been the kind of straight path through that, through that area. Um, or wherever, I don't remember. Albuquerque, maybe that's probably the big city and Santa Fe just looked cool. So like, what if I just went there and yeah, that's hard to do. I don't know if it's just the technology or if it's just, I think I have to get out of the zone of like work and regular life to feel like I have that space, you know, to kind of fool around and, but honestly, that was a big part of, you know, I mentioned before that when I started writing nonfiction, a lot of it came out of just writing in notebooks. And I feel like that too, I mean, I had to get out of this headspace of like every word I'm writing has to be part of a project and I need to have like, you know, what's this line going to be on my CV eventually. And instead just being like, what if I just did some writing and see what happens? And I think that's probably hard to do because we are so kind of, you know, we're so used to having our lives very managed, I guess. So. Yeah. Like, what do you mean? Today? Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know, like in general. Um, I mean, I should say, you know, I took this trip in like, this was probably 2015. So it's been a good while. Like the book is more recent, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that I'm enough of an expert to say. What are we doing now? Oh, another question. Yeah. Oh, oh, for sure. Um, yeah, not not to um, you know roast New Jersey again, but uh, <laughs> I mean I live in Philly, and I feel like now my driving is very un like not that much fun because it's a lot of just like traffic and whatever. But no, I feel like specifically I knew places I could go and drive around where there weren't going to be many people, like where you can kind of go drive up through the hills and like get out to where you don't have to worry about that stuff. And yeah, it was more like every now and then you get stuck behind a tractor maybe and it's annoying, but otherwise it was fine. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak for a moment about how you focus the journal you did on the trip and you turned it into Oh, yeah, both. Uh, well, I would say, first of all, well, yeah. So with this book, it was kind of a weird process because I first did a lot of that and turned it into a pretty short essay and then only later expanded it into a book. So a lot of the expansion was kind of diving into more research about um, some of the figures that I talked about in the book and some of the Route 66 stuff. Um, also, it turned out there, the woman who was my editor on the book had also read other essays I had written. And one of her suggestions was that she felt like I was going over you know, she's like, I feel like you're having this kind of crisis of that also comes out in some other pieces of writing. And like, what if there are things you can kind of pull from those pieces? So there was a little bit of that. Um, I would say more generally with my writing and with nonfiction, I've tended to um, think of it as writing what I call like a draft zero, which is basically the part where I just sit down and just write a bunch of stuff. And then I just write a bunch of drafts. And I feel like usually for me, um, there's whatever thing I think I'm writing about to begin with. And then at some point in that process, I realized that I'm actually writing about something else. And once I figure out what that other thing is, that's kind of the animating energy. So that, like, I don't think I would have had the interest to sustain a long piece like this on the, a road trip if it was literally just about, like, I'm in a car, I'm driving around, you know? But over time, you kind of realize, like, oh, there's more 
stuff that I'm interested in beyond that. But yeah, I guess the short answer to that is I only figure that out by just writing a bunch of drafts and like messing around. Yeah. Oh, right. No, that's a good question. And I've kind of become desensitized to it because I also teach nonfiction and I have to be careful sometimes because I forget that particularly, if, you know, if I might have a student who's not coming in as like a really experienced writer and you're asking them to write about their life. And sometimes I can have that editor hat on where I'm like, oh, say more about that terrible thing that happened. <laughs> and they're like, I don't want to. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I get that. Um, but I think also just as a writer, like I think by the time I was having those editorial conversations, I was a little divorced from it. Um, I think it also helped that, you know, this trip, like I said, was in maybe 2015 and it was only, it was like a few years later by the time I even started working on like a book of it. So one of the things that was, I mean, both challenging and helpful in that, like the helpful part was I had like literal distance from this version of myself so that I was like, oh, that's fine. Like, I don't. Like, I don't feel like I'm in that thing anymore. That was also sometimes a challenge because sometimes you're like, okay, well, I've figured out the answer to this dumb question that my, you know, several years ago self didn't know, but you have to kind of put yourself back in that version of yourself. Um, but yeah, to your question about the editing, I think it made it easier because it had been a while. So I was like, oh yeah, you're right. That previous version of myself, boy, what a mess. It's good. Everything's cool now. It's like just FYI, everything's great. And uh, <laughs> none of those problems exist anymore. Uh, so that helped, you know. I mean, kind of both. I was aware of it in the sense of, I'm like, well, from a pitch perspective, I mean, I guess the book was already gonna become a book, but I like, I had that thought that like the short summary of this book is like aging white dude has a midlife crisis while driving across the country. And I was like, I don't, I kind of feel like that book exists and maybe we don't need another one of them. Uh, so yeah, I think I was both conscious of like, oh, it's interesting to maybe play around with that and maybe also try to subvert that a little bit. I mean. I feel like I fall for that stuff where like I kind of have a romantic notion of the road and I was literally, you know, I was earnestly interested in like all the Route 66 stuff and kind of tra tracing that. But then, you know, also I would have those moments where you're like, oh, right, this is this kind of cheesy nostalgia that whitewashes a lot of stuff or that's an oversimplified story of history. And so, yeah, I definitely thought about that, especially as I continue to add pieces and, and work on it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Cool. Uh, you started with both men, right? Or new, mm. right? And um, you're there. Um, you talk about the very deep. By the way, I don't think you're going to be too high if you want to use that level of question. But maybe you could also talk about your choice to start the narrative there mm. instead of going to the start of the Right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess. It is a little bit of that cliched thing in like a movie or something where, you know, you see this character in like disarray and everything's falling apart around them. And they're like, how did I get here? And then it like flashes back. And I didn't want it to seem like cheesy in that way. But I think that was actually one of the things in the book that was just always the same. Like the probably first version of the draft of the essay version of this was this very short section about how I just started crying in the middle of the desert. Um, and then it, oh, uh, sure, yeah. Just, you mean like the very beginning part? Uh, sure, yeah, it's only a couple sentences, or a few sentences. Uh, so this is the beginning. I was on a two-lane highway in the desert, somewhere between the Arizona border and Joshua Tree, when I finally broke down and cried. I say finally, because a part of me had been waiting to cry for the last 2,500 miles, but I didn't realize I'd been waiting to cry until I actually started crying, and I couldn't say, can't say even now, exactly what the crying was about. They were big, dumb tears. I had to pull the car onto the shoulder. It was embarrassing. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, from a writing perspective, one thing that I felt like, I felt like it kind of started, like it posed a question maybe, not just to the reader, but like to myself, that was like, well, why did I have this scene in the middle of the desert that was kind of embarrassing? And so that gave me something to then kind of propel parts of the narrative of like, 
while I'm trying to figure that out, you know? So then it didn't feel like starting it. Like there's some versions of starting at the end where you feel like, well, why are you just giving away like the plot? But I feel like for something like this, it's more setting up that central question of like, well, why am I having a breakdown in the middle of the desert, you know? Um, well, a couple things. Um, I have a draft of a novel that I'm working on, not the one that I abandoned years ago. Although I just the other day had this kind of moment of, I don't know if it's a, it's probably not a breakthrough until it actually leads to something real, but where it dawned on me that the book that I had been working on, um, the kind of like background characters were the parents of the, who I was thinking of as the main character and who are a little bit older. And I'm like, I feel like I'm old enough now that I'm more interested in them and their story. And so I could actually see myself going back with a different perspective. Um, I have a, a different novel that I'm like working on revisions of. And then um, I just started this nonfiction project that I'm not sure what I'm gonna, I think I may just do it as like a Substack stack thing um, where the premise is, or the conceit is um, it's called like personal effects. And the idea is that I've been like pulling things out of boxes and out of my basement and storage and whatever, and using like an object or a, a thing that's kind of been, you know, the idea of kind of like personal archives. So like using that as, as a writing prompt and then just writing like a very short piece um, based on that. So that's kind of what I've been up to. Anybody else have questions? All right, is that, is that it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted me to like dance around or do anything. <laughs> Sing? Oh no. Nobody wants that. Well, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to those of you on Zoom. Um, oh, were there Zoom questions that I needed to answer? Um, I don't see anything, just some like nice comments and stuff. So no, I think we're good. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Please stay for coffee, cupcakes. There are uh, a few copies of Mike's book for sale. Um, this is our last formal event for uh, this year. So thank you all. And thank you to my class for all of your great questions. Good night. <laughs>